Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Sandy Bitch, and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm sure honored to be here at your 17th Pennsylvania State Convention. I love being in the middle of uh, AA celebrating itself. And that's what's going on here. We're so thrilled, each one of us in this room, with the amount of sobriety that we have. And we like to tell the state and the fellowship how grateful we are that we're all here together. And I want to thank the committee, and it's been fun seeing old friends. Um, I think the highlight of my weekend occurred this afternoon when I was in the coffee room. And um, I saw a table that looked like it would be a good one to sit at. And I ended up with the uh, unholy trio from Lancaster. (laughs) They were all new. And it was very exciting to be amongst them. And one of them, uh, Rob, particularly struck me that he was expressing how hard it was to be brand new and be in the middle of all these people. (laughs) And what do you do? Am I sticking out like a sore thumb and all that? And, And we stayed there and we had a great time. And it felt good. And so I got a new friend in my prayers and thoughts. And Rob, I don't want you to let me down because um, you have a mission to accomplish and that is you're going to go back and work with your sponsor. You're going to get sober and pretty soon you're going to be sponsoring people and you're going to be back here a couple years from now because you can hardly wait. (laughs) You know, you're not going to be uncomfortable. You're going to really enjoy it. And you're going to wander into that coffee room. <clears throat> and you're going to see a guy with that deer in the headlights look. About ready to leave the room. And you're going to go over and introduce yourself. And you're going to save his life. So don't, don't fail us on that mission. I don't want to put a lot of pressure on you, but... <laughs> Um, I've had some surgery, so after the, it, I can stand up okay, but not the whole time, so I'm going to sit on that stool at the end of the meeting, so if you're looking for me, I'll be over there. <laughs> I, um, uh, I want to talk about my daughters. Um, the AA grapevine is really powerful, and when things happen to people, it somehow gets all over the country. And I got um, about 350 cards. I've gotten telephone calls and emails, and it's just been amazing. And the reason I want to talk about this just briefly is to um, share with you some lessons that I learned from others over the years that carried me through this. And these are very valuable lessons, and uh, so I hope they'll be helpful to you. But uh, on March 3rd, my <clears throat> youngest daughter, Barbara, was uh, murdered in her home in Madison. <laughs> she had taken her daughter to high school, and when she came home, somebody was waiting and really brutally murdered her. And um, my second daughter, Conway, and my first daughter, Barbie, had five years in AA, and I had um, been up to, the, and she was the chairman of the New Haven Conference, big conference. And I had the honor of speaking at it. And my other daughter introduced me. So this was quite a celebration. Anyway, the second daughter, Conway, discovered the body and, and took charge and was just a mainstay throughout the whole thing. Uh, because it's very difficult because you have the press and you have the police and, and it just, 
she got the family together, and uh, after she talked to me, I had just had surgery, and I couldn't go up. And it was killing me not to be with my family. They were all there for three or four weeks waiting for the police to release things and all that. But I was able to make it up to the memorial service. And my um, girlfriend, wonderful lady, my spiritual partner and so on down, and my best friend Chris Brubaker went with me, and they kind of helped me get upstairs and get through it. And it was a wonderful memorial service, 300 AAs and 50 family members. And it was, uh, it was just very powerful, typical AA event. And the next month, um, my girlfriend and I had been on, she's one of the most spiritual people I knew. She'd been at this about 30 years in her church. And we just talked about God, and she helped me a lot understanding her point of view and this and that. And she just was moved to go and get closer on her path and decided that we weren't on parallel paths. I know it sounds complicated, but so that came to an end, and we decided to pray for each other to get through it. And then earlier this month, my oldest daughter, Kathy, died of alcoholism up in Virginia. And um, she died of alcoholism in spite of the fact that her father had 45 years and her two sisters were in AA, and she saw how happy we all were. But it shows you the powerlessness of this disease and how you can't reach in if the whole family's in denial. And it, it was just... And um, so she suddenly got sick and went to the hospital with advanced cirrhosis, and within a week, she, and it's a horrible death when the liver um, kicks the kidneys out. And then, boy, it is ugly. So with that and the surgeries and all that, it's been an interesting year. So, But I wanted to share with you the lessons I had ahead of time. Oh, thanks. That, sh that paid off. They paid off so big I can hardly tell you. I had about 25 years sobriety. I was up in Washington, D.C., and I thought I had my act together. I thought it was really connected spiritually. And on the local news one night, it seems that um, one teenage boy had shot and killed another teenage boy. The boy that was killed was an A student. The other one was probably a drug dealer or something. The kid was in the wrong time, place at the wrong time. And the reporter had found his mother, and they were interviewing her. And it was a very dignified black lady who caught my attention because she was so composed. And they stuck the microphone in her face and said, how do you feel about the boy that killed your son? And she looked the reporter right in the face and said, I've already forgiven him. He was too far away from God. And except for the sadness in her eyes, the sorrow over the loss, she was at peace. There was no resentment, there was no anger, and there was no hatred. And I knew I had seen something way beyond where I was, if you know what I mean. I just, I didn't know that was possible. I had no idea you could do that. But I never forgot it, and I talked about it a lot. I talked with my friends. I said, none of my friends in AA saw it. And I, I talked about that a lot. And then uh, maybe about five years later, somebody told me about a woman in AA who had done the same thing when a drunk driver hit her son, and that she had handled it exactly that way. And then the final thing was the Amish. You remember when the murders took place up there and the family of the boy that was killed? went over to comfort the family of the boy that did the killing because they knew that that family must be suffering on the same day. And I looked at that stuff and I said, I want to be like that. Uh, you know what I mean? I said, I, I see what it is. You have to apply the principles in the moment that they happen. That's when they have their power. Acceptance has its biggest power when you accept immediately. Forgiveness has its biggest power when you forgive immediately. And so when my daughter called me and said, are you sitting down? I said, oh boy, somebody got drunk. 
You know, whenever somebody says, oh, you're sitting down, you generally are looking for that. And she started talking, and I started remembering what I had seen. And as she was talking, I fully accepted that my relationship with Barbie was on a new level. From now on, it's going to be composed of memories and stories. And I'll be able to talk about it till the cows come home. And it'll still be wonderful. And whoever did it is forgiven. And I'm here to tell you that when you do that, you shut the door on resentment, anger, and hatred, and they can't get in. They simply can't get in. And when you think about the suffering that we do, it isn't the sorrow, it's resentment, anger, and hatred. That's what hurts. That's what's so painful. And God helps us with sadness and sorrow. He just holds us. But if you've got a big resentment, he says, get rid of it. Then I'll help you. you got to forgive. You've got to accept whatever it is. So I just can't get over how powerful that was, and I will never forget it. And when, my, when I got the news of my uh, older daughter, I don't know what made me do it. And I think, again, I had read or heard about this. I didn't think about it until I went to my God to tell him I loved him. That's what I did. That's how I handled it. I just turned away from the news and said, God, I love you. I just want you to know that none of this will affect how I feel about you. And I just stayed there loving God for a few minutes. And then I turned back to look at the, you know, the news. And I felt like I was just being lifted and turned around to look at it. And I was able to accept it and just have sadness, which I still have. But it is such a small burden compared to resentment anger, and hatred. And so that's all I want to say, um, because I hope if something like that happens, you'll remember this and realize that you can save yourself a lot of suffering if you apply these principles now. And so, okay, so now I'm back to my story. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the indulgence to do that. <laughs> And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm up here. I am so happy about AA. I'm so enthusiastic about life. And I think God's the greatest thing we have. And so I, uh, I just feel like full speed ahead and it, and it feels good. And all that love and support I got was just marvelous. Anyway, I got sober in 1964 on Pearl Harbor Day. I had the same sponsor for 42 years. He was another Marine, and we had a lot of fun together. Um, we became best friends as time went on, and we shared all kinds of ups and downs in our lives. Even though I had moved away from him, he was in Virginia. And um, he was dying of, um, he didn't stop smoking, so he was dying of lung cancer. And I got to go up and visit him near the end, and um, we went to the first meeting he ever took me to, and they had me speak, and he's out there in the wheelchair, and we reminisced about all that. And when I, when I left him to come back to Florida, we just shook hands and said, this has been one hell of a run, and it was. I'm a very lucky man to have had that man in my life, and his name was Bill Terwilliger. Um, I was born in 1931. I grew up in New Haven, Connecticut, and the biggest event in my life was World War II. That was the, <laughs> I mean, it just absorbed all the energy of, um, from the time I was 10 years old till I was 15 years old. And um, it just makes me so good to see the American flag up here and to be happy to be in this God-blessed country. It's just the most wonderful place to live. And there was a great parallel between AA and the United States of America at that time. The country had a fatal enemy, just like we have a fatal enemy, alcoholism. 
and that fatal enemy brings you together. One of the things that ensures AA unity is that alcohol is still out there walking around, waiting for us to screw up and have an argument or something, and he's out there, come on over, you'd feel better if you have a drink, and it beat the hell out of us. And so that was the sense that everyone had. They said, boy, if we don't stick together, we could lose the whole country. So there was a unity that only can exist when you have that common enemy. It, it, once it's gone, and then you're free to go do your own thing, then we all <laughs> take off in opposite directions. But there was a marvelous magic period during those years that I remember something that was quite remarkable. And everybody had... Somebody in the Army, the Air Force, I had an uncle in the Air Force, and he was a pilot, and I just thought he was wonderful. And I remember my mother was an air spotter, and she went up on the hill and reported every airplane that flew by. People were along the shore up in New England looking for submarines. Everything was rationed. About every two months, my mother would look at her pots and pans. She'd pick out another saucepan and take it over to the center of town and throw it in the in barbed wire enclosure where they took pans and melted them down for bullets and that kind of stuff. And by the time the war was over, I think she had three pots left out of the whole kitchen. They were, they were all gone. And so it was, um, it was just a, an amazing time. Yeah, my parents went through the Depression, and somehow they provided well for my sister and I. My sister's got 33 years in AA up in Connecticut. And um, say some prayers. She has stage four liver cancer. And we're praying for a miracle. And they happen all the time. So I talk to her and we know it's going to be fine. Um, and yet, as I sat at that table, four people, I felt like I didn't belong in that family. There's no reason for me to feel that way. But alcoholics seem to specialize in that. You know what I mean? There's the three of them. And then I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm just sitting at the table. <laughs> <laughs> Part of me thinks I belong on another planet. I don't know what I'm doing in here. And there's no reason to have that. But once I had that perception, that became my reality. That's what I had to live with, was that I was the loner on the outside. And my sister and I went to Catholic Church. She still goes there and thinks it's the friendliest place in the world. She has received nothing but comfort from the day she walked in there. I, on the other hand... <laughs> sitting right next to her thought it was something out of Auschwitz <laughs> um, I was terrified by the whole thing they're speaking in a language I don't understand they're putting smelly stuff out and I thought it might make me dizzy the little nuns with their little outfits <laughs> I didn't know what they were up to, and they always had my ear, and they're pulling me. And, <laughs> and I didn't see the loving God. I didn't see anything. I just saw what I perceived. And confession, <laughs> I wasn't telling them anything because I knew they were gathering evidence for later <laughs> when they were really going to get me. So you can see. You can see I had no comfort, and yet it wasn't the church doing that. It was me. That's how I was looking at it. And now I see it as a, oh, my God, what a wonderful place. But I didn't see it that way. So I didn't have any comfort from the idea of God. And I was, you know, the loner, etc. But I did well in school, and I also had polio. They had a big epidemic, and I was gone for about a half a year, um, I Right arm wouldn't move, and my left right arm would, uh, leg would barely move. And fortunately, the Sister Kenny treatment helped a very small percentage, and I got about 80, 90 percent back. Um, but I did well in school, pretty good athlete. We have a little prep school in New Haven called Hopkins. <laughs> that school's going to be 350 years old this year. That's an old school. And uh, I did well there. I just thrived on it. There was 40 people in the class. So when you went out for athletics, you looked good. There wasn't many other. You might be the only one doing that. And so I really enjoyed it. And uh, they had very good teachers. And it was a pipeline right into Yale, which is the local school. 
And I had worked on their buildings. I was involved in construction and this and that. My father worked there. So I didn't think much about it till I went there as a student. And I'm starting to mix with all these rich guys that are coming in from all around the country. And I suddenly realized, I don't belong here. This is, I'm not in their league. I, I was, I just wanted to leave. I was terrified they were going to find out I was a loser and I didn't belong in there. And my roommates are saying, come on, drink, you're in college. No, I'm not going to drink. And I don't remember exactly why, but I wasn't going to do it. And I, in every talk I mentioned this, my name was on a list to go to this hall and socialize with 30 other guys from around the country. Just walk up and get to know all 30 of them. I'd rather go into combat than go up and <laughs> stick my hand out. <coughs> But I was going to give it a try, and I looked around the room to see some friendly eyes, and they were all looking at me like, don't you come over here, you little bird. And I'm like, okay, I'm going over there. Don't worry. I'm going to... And these guys didn't want Nobody wanted to know me. So I didn't meet anybody. I just walked around. I was getting ready to leave, and they had a bar. And I said, well, maybe I'll have a drink. My roommate said it makes you feel good. I went over, drank something, whiskey, drank another one. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Nothing's happening. I had half of the third one. I think I was about to give up on alcohol <laughs> when I turned around and I still can feel it. Those 30 mean guys were gone and there was 30 of the friendliest guys I've ever seen. <laughs> Everybody in the room was looking at me, wanting to know me personally. <laughs> hey, you, please come over. Go, Jeez, I don't know where the hell to start. <laughs> you know what I mean? I said, wow. And I started over, I just picked one group arbitrarily, and I started over there. And on the way over, I started going, they're right. They would be lucky to know me. <laughs> so that's a pretty big thing to happen in 15 minutes. That's huge. Every problem I ever had in my life was gone. And I went over and I talked to everybody. Oh, Wisconsin, hi, Badger. Oh, yeah, you're from California. Yeah, I had so, jeez. They're starting to leave. I'm going, where are you going? We're just getting started here. And they're all gone. So I went up to the bar and I went, man, three drinks did that. What would 20 drinks do? I mean, that was. <laughs> so all on that first night, I got my full exposure to alcohol. <laughs> then back in the room and vomiting and puking and dry heaving and lying on the floor in the bathroom and dying. And it's awful. And the next morning feeling like. This is, oh, my God, I wonder if you're going to live through this. And the thought occurred to me, well, are you going to drink again tonight? And it was like, yes, I am. <laughs> I said, this puking and dying is a small price to pay for what I had last night. <laughs> so a non-alcoholic wouldn't be talking like that because what happened to me with alcohol was way beyond what happens to non-alcoholics. They just have fun. I experienced the entire secret of life. <laughs> I had the equivalent of a spiritual awakening. I saw the world as God sees it. I saw the world where everyone loved each other, and I loved that place, and the only way to get there was through drinking. And so drinking went from a non-event to the top priority. Athletics, well, I wasn't that good anyway. Uh -huh. <laughs> Studies, um, I switched. I switched all the majors that I had. Somehow I had a way I could learn languages without hardly trying, so I suddenly became very interested in South American Spanish. <laughs> what a waste of an education. <laughs> and I started getting arrested, and I started getting in trouble, and all the things that happened with alcohol. And the Korean War was going on, the draft. Everybody had to join the military, and I barely graduated. And five or six of us were drinking beer, and somebody said, let's go join the Marine Corps. Yeah, oh, we go out, and I can hardly wait, and isn't this nice? And God, I got um, brochures from different bases the Marine Corps has, and they all had golf courses. Well, they don't really let you play golf when you first start out. And it was a shock. But after a while, I fell in love with it. 
this was unity. You weren't anybody. You were part of something. And I felt, I just went, oh, this is it. I just fell in love with the whole Marine Corps. And I got went through six-month training, became a platoon leader, saw a movie about pilots. That looked very exciting. I'd never been in a plane, but I signed up anyway. And somehow passed all the tests and the written and the physical. Met this lovely woman who's the mother of our six children. And she's really suffering through these. You know, we've been divorced about 30 years, but we're like this. We're very, very close. And boy, it's very hard on a mother. Very, very difficult. But she's doing, doing okay. So anyway, we met and um, got married and I'm off to Pensacola, Florida to get my golden wings in 18 months. And I got airsick on the way down on the commercial <laughs> flight. And uh, man, it was the old propeller planes, you know. <clears throat> and I was sick a few times. And, but finally, that motion sickness went away. And all of a sudden, I was very good at something. I would be number two or three as we went through night flying and gunnery and bombing formation and go aboard the carrier and then advanced training and then get into jets. And lo and behold, I make it all the way through. I get assigned to a fighter squadron overseas and the war's over. And uh, so we're over there flying these beautiful airplanes. It was so exciting just to be there, be with these old timers who were pretty famous aviators. And I, and I just uh, I said, you know, this is the most wonderful thing in the world. And besides that, they all drank a lot. The colonel drank a lot, and we got together at the club and had a table of our own, a big model of our airplane in the middle, and he would call the waitress, so, give all my boys a round of drinks. I mean, so he ordered all the drinks. And they drank fast enough that I didn't have to sneak them. You remember when you're in a crowd and, <laughs> hey, man, when am I going to? I'll be right back. Got to go to the bathroom. You remember that? And you go up, hey, bartender, give me a double scotch. Okay. Bam, bam. Oh, another round. Yeah, I'll have another one. Yeah. Well, I didn't have to do that. They're all going as fast as I'm going. So I just fit in. All this fun. And I've been there about nine months. It's a 14-month tour overseas. And uh, I was out on the end of the runway with the major, the maintenance officer, and we were practicing to go aboard the carrier, and we were watching our buddies make the runway landings, critiquing them. Too high, look at that. And, uh, and he started talking about soon he'll be a lieutenant colonel going to get his own squadron. He wants nothing but the best pilots. And he points to me, a young lieutenant, and he says, and I want you in there. And I'm going, oh, man. And then he said, but I wouldn't let you drink. And I'm, I pretended I didn't hear him. I wasn't, I wasn't going to deal with that. I'm going, I remember thinking, why would he say that? We all get drunk together. We're all da -da -da -da. And it wasn't until I got an AA that I realized I'm in a bunch of heavy drinkers, and my drinking scares them. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm doing something beyond heavy drinking. I'm drinking with an intensity that he saw scared him. Well, that didn't slow me down, so I went... Uh, I had 14 years in the Marine Corps before I lost the whole career due to drinking. And uh, and we started having kids, and pretty soon we had six. And I got promoted to first lieutenant, and then I got promoted to captain. And I had wonderful tours of duty. I was at the 1st Marine Division and uh, fighter squadron over there and flight instructor. And then I got into a uh, photo squadron during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And we're flying the Crusader. And it, everything looked wonderful except the disease was winning, and it was taken over inside, and I was starting to get shaky, and I didn't want to get in that plane, because I was starting to pass out or feel like I'm going to pass out. I was sweating. I was going through withdrawals, because I wouldn't drink for eight hours, and it was getting scary, but there was no alcohol program. I never heard of AA. I just said, I guess you just got to keep doing this. So I just kept climbing in. It was a period of about eight months there that were, God, it was really scary. And I'd fly sometimes with one hand on the ejection seat. The photo plane has all the cameras around the uh, stick. So you can actually fly the mission with one hand on the ejection seat. My theory being if I passed out, I'd fire that damn thing. And um, 
which I probably wouldn't, but it felt it was comfortable. <laughs> and then the chute opens at 10,000 feet, the plane crashes, problem solved. You know what I mean? It was. So anyway, that was the condition I was in as I came down to the final days. And we were on a cross country. We had two airplanes. One was the hot potato F-8, and the other one was an F-3D. It was a radar plane, had a radar guy in the right seat. And there was four of us flying back from across country on a Sunday afternoon, beautiful day. And all of a sudden, I had to get out of that plane. I just went, I have to get out of here now. I think I saw I was going to have a heart attack or something awful was going to happen. I don't know if you ever had to leave where you were now. But I had to leave. And it had no ejection seat. And I remember the, I tried it once. There was some panel you lifted up and you had to slide out the bottom. And I was looking at it. And I went, hey, this guy doesn't know how to fly. I can't just get out of here. So I called the flight leader and declared an oxygen emergency. And then you all have to land. So he spotted an Air Force base nearby. We landed. I ran over. I had a couple drinks in the club. I'm sweating like hell. I didn't say anything. Just acted like that. We went down the next morning, and there was no problem with the oxygen. You know, the maintenance people said, there's nothing wrong with this oxygen. And I turned to the flight leader, and I said, I can't do this anymore. He said, what do you mean? I said, I can't do this anymore. And my alcoholism told me I was through with flying. I've been doing this 14 years. It's my favorite thing. It's my whole life. And I turned and said, I'm not going to do this anymore. So somebody else flew us back. And I had to go see the colonel. He said, what are you talking about? I said, I don't want to do it anymore. Why? I just don't want to do it anymore. And I just wouldn't say a word. And they finally had to have me sign something. And I waited three months so the Marine Corps could give me some other specialty. And during that three months, I did the legal work for the squadron. I had a little office. And I wouldn't look anybody in the eye. I knew those guys. It was a very special squadron. There were no lieutenants. It was a lieutenant colonel, major, and all captains. And... I knew they were looking in, just going, how did we get that piece of crap in our squadron? Look at that guy in there. What a loser. And I would just do the work, and I'd sweat, and I sweat. All I felt was shame, three months of solid shame. And then I got transferred. I don't, I don't know if I even said goodbye to people. And I went on and got another specialty and then eventually ended up in the nut ward with DTs and um, convulsions and all that, and that soon after that, I lost everything and was out. Well, two years ago, I was out in um, Los Angeles going to the Brentwood group, and it's about 500 members in that group. And the meeting is done by having an old timer come up, talk a little bit, and then talk on a topic like humility or surrender or whatever. And then after half an hour, then people in the audience raise their hand. And he answers the questions. And Chuck Chamberlain used to go there all the time. And I just go, oh, my God, wouldn't that be fun to ask Chuck questions? And a lady was coming to get her 30-year medallion. And um, her husband's not in AA, and he drove her there. And she mentioned, he, he went often to stay with me, but he was going to go out and get coffee. And she mentioned Sandy Beach is here. He said, was he a pilot? She said, yeah. She said, I think I know him. Tell him to come out here. So I walk out, and here's this guy I've never seen in my life. And he said, in 1962, you were in a flight of four F-3Ds on a cross country, and you declared an oxygen emergency. <laughs> and all the planes landed, and you never flew again. And I went, how do you know that? He said, I was in the plane with you. And so, <laughs> what are the odds 42 years later that I'm going to run into the guy that was in the plane. Turns out he wasn't a radar guy. He was a pilot from uh, who had been recalled from American Airlines during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the reason it was all pilots was there was a hurricane coming, coming to Cherry Point, and you have to go fly all the airplanes somewhere safe, and then you drink till the hurricane goes away. So there wasn't any radar guys going on that mission. This was all for the drinking pilots. So that's why he was in the plane. 
So he came back the next night where I was talking up at Oxnard, and he brought all his photographs from the squadron. Oh, yeah, that's the colonel. Yeah, and then I saw this guy, and then there's there going on the carry. He had all these wonderful pictures. And then he said, did you know how popular you were in that squadron? It broke our hearts that you were leaving. The colonel was going crazy. He called every single person that he knew. He even talked to the commandant. I want to save this guy. I don't want him to go. When you left, we were almost crying. Well, that's not what I remember. <laughs> that's not the way that I remember it. So I was forced, ladies and gentlemen, to go back 42 years ago and totally change my past. I went in and erased all the shame. Sorry, shame, but you're not here. <laughs> and I filled it in with everybody who liked me, and I was popular, and they were so sad that I had to leave. <laughs> and whenever I think about that period of time, I go, man, that was really something. <laughs> so what has that got to do with AA? You just saw someone getting rid of old ideas and being set free. And a tremendous amount of our old ideas aren't true. But we think they are. It was our perception that they were true, and therefore we react emotionally to them. I remember hearing a speaker who said, my story is divided into two parts, what happened during the years that I drank and what I thought happened during the years that I drank. And <laughs> Everybody laughed, and we all thought that was funny, but that's what we could say about any period of our life. My childhood is divided into two parts what happened when I was a child and what I thought happened when I was a child. And as we get sober and as God reveals the truth to us, slowly and slowly, our parents become better. Our childhood is understood. Our family suddenly is much more loving than we thought. Our teachers were nicer than we remember. The nuns, the priests, the whole church is so much better than it used to be as I've gone back and changed and changed. And that's what spirituality is. It is getting rid of the old perception about your life and replacing it little by little with the truth. And eventually, you see, when we think that way, we live in that world. And everybody lives in their own little world. They tease people. You know her. She lives in her own little world. Well, so do you. And so do I. And you could be married 65 years, and you still don't know the other person's little world. You don't know exactly what they're feeling about this or that. I mean, we still exist in these separate little worlds. But what is the building material of those worlds? Thought. That's how you build the whole thing. You think it. This church is scary. Well, then you better start getting scared. Yeah, I am scared. I feel scared. It's really scary. <laughs> I did it. I built this world that I lived in, and I was the only one in it. But I was in charge of it. There wasn't any God in there. I didn't need a God. I'm the God. I'm in charge here. I'm charged. And that world was lonely, and it was frightening, but it was mine. And that's where we all end up. And I could honestly say, well, have you ever seen God? You've you never been in here. Never been in here. Of course he isn't in there. I didn't let him in. I was the God in there. I'm in charge. And boy, that's a lonely place to live. And that's what self-centeredness is. And I want to say something about humility when I think of self-centeredness. We, we say a lot of strange things about humility, that if you're talking about it, you don't have it and all that. And if you're new, don't listen to any of that. That's just absurd. Every time you go to a meeting, that's an act of humility. Every time you say a prayer, that's being humble. Every time you read the big book, that's being humble. Any time you get a sponsor, that's being humble. You are making the statement that you can't make it on your own. And you need help, and you need this book, and you need the steps, and you need this. All of that is pure humility. It's a statement that I can't make it. And humility, like prayer, 
is a very powerful practice and it has to be practiced. And I would make this statement that humility is the only possible escape route from the horrible prison of self-centeredness. It's the only way out. It's impossible to get out without humility. Because in order to get out, you have to admit with every fiber in your body that you can't get out of there. You can't buy your way out. You can't get dynamite and blow self-centeredness open. You can't get a hot air balloon and go over the top of the prison walls. And you can't tunnel out. You can't get out of there. Well, pride doesn't like to admit that much of a defeat. And humility is what says, God, I can't get out of here. There's nothing I can do about being self-centered. Will you help me? And the door is open. And that's the only way out. But you first have to realize that there's no way you can make a dent in self-centeredness. No way. What are you going to do? Become unself-centered? What the heck is that? Well, I used to be self-centered. Now I'm unself-centered. I was self-centered when I was standing over there, but now I'm standing over there. Of course you're self-centered. How could you not be self-centered? All of us were little. We stood out in the backyard. We started looking around the neighborhood. Hey, there's the school. There's the over there. There's the farm. Over here's my house. Guess what's in the middle? Me. Everywhere I look around, I'm in the middle. You have to end up self-centered. But as we grow up, you get rid of it, but alcoholics don't grow up. So we arrive here, sorry, with extreme self-centeredness. And this program gets the antidote to that, which is God-centered. The only way out. And so with my sponsor, with all the things that happened in my life, I've been granted a vision of life that is precious. Each year, the view gets better. Each year, I look around and see God's world more clearly than I ever saw it before. I've had more growth in the last five years than the first 40 years in AA. And I think the reason I did is that I have been a seeker since my sponsor turned me on to that. You know where it says, seek God, seek, seek. And our literature tells us that. You just keep looking. You just keep looking. And when finally you draw near, he discloses himself to you. He discloses himself to you. When we say the spiritual life is not a theory, what it means is God is no longer a theory. Up until you have a spiritual experience, God is a theory. You have faith that he's there. You believe other people have had contact with him. But as far as you're concerned, you're existing on faith alone. But when God walks up and taps you on the shoulder and says, I'm real, that's a new ball game. That's a new ball game. And that's what an awakening is. And our job is to see if we can develop that awakening and that contact more and more and more so that we can experience the presence of the true reality more and more. And this, as our 11th step tells us, is an individual adventure. See, the steps get in our sponsor. They get us through all everything else except improving our conscious contact with God through prayer and meditation. And this is done, as our literature suggests, with all kinds of outside literature. Ooh. <laughs> and teachers. And there's just amazing channels that we can explore to deepen our AA program. So I'm getting near the end of my time, and I want to turn back to those of you that are new. It's almost impossible to imagine what's going to happen to you. You came here to just stop drinking and get the world off your back. But we don't have any way of letting you do that. In order to stay stopped, and in order to get the world off your back, you have to take all these steps which lead you to your own creator, your own definition of whatever this is. And when you suddenly realize that that inside of you that knew there was something missing ever since you were little, you thought it was money or sex or something, it turned out to be you want a reunion with your higher power. 
You and I have been prodigal sons and prodigal daughters. Yeah, yeah, we know. You can, you got everything wonderful for us, but I think I can improve on that, God. I'm going to go out and do it myself. I can really be a winner. I can get this all done. And we go out there and fail. And fortunately, we fail to the extent we become desperate. The only blessing we are ever given is the blessedness of desperation. And only the desperate can have this awakening. That's where you have to get. And that's what all of us were given with desperation. Your drinking took you down or you're thinking of suicide and your ego was pried open enough to hold up the white flag and say, please. And in came the jackpot. What a way to earn the jackpot. Puking your guts out, wave a flag, and they hand you the keys to the kingdom. That's not a bad story. So if you've gotten desperate, you're going to win. And um, I'd like to be around to watch each one of you when you have this experience and your eyes light up and the people around you see it first and they go, look at Alice, look at her glowing over there. She doesn't even know what's happening to her. And then it's going to, this is what, we have a sentence in the big book. You suddenly realize God is doing for you what you couldn't do for yourself. When you have that moment, pass it on. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.